All right, Dave. Everybody hear me? No, not at all? Better? Yeah? I got over here and over here is going better. Hey, sorta. Speak loud. Is that to them? I'm gonna swallow it here in a minute. I mean, come on. All right. Anyway, welcome to Celebrate Recovery. Hello, Forever family. This is where all the cool people hang out on Tuesday night, right? All right. Well, let's thank Dave for the music. All right. We got Mike over there at the literature table. Free stuff, good stuff. And we got Paul over there. Are you the greeter, Paul? How you doing? All right. Oh, Tom, I can't see him. Tom is one of the few guys at CR that I see eye to eye with. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, here to celebrate, welcome to Celebrate Recovery. Uh, I am an ex addict that struggles with anger, obsessive compulsive behavior. That's this week, all right? And uh, my name is Tim. All right, before we get started, we got a few uh, housekeeping rules. If you're not familiar with our campus, uh, the facilities are located just right over here. There's a picture on each door. Pick the one that looks most like you, and you'll be all right. Uh, if you got to smoke, hey, man, no judgment, no problem. But unfortunately, this is a non-smoking campus, and you're going to have to step out to the sidewalk. The fastest way there is just right down this hallway. Take a right. Look for the traffic. You'll be out there, no problem. All right, do we have any announcements? Hey. I'm a grateful believer, struggles with codependency and depression. My name is Freya. Good to be with you all. So um, just announcements uh, for those of you who want to know, um, our step studies, men's step study is now closed. They're, they've moved on to the second book. Um, so um, talk to the leaders about a time in the future, but they're, they're uh, closed for now. Uh, but women's step study is open. So women, if you are still looking to join we are meeting on Sundays from 1 to 2 30 in room a 114 that's right we moved rooms so that we have bathroom access all right come join us online people all right Woo thank you Freya all right we left in that <laughs> anyway focus I uh, here at celebrate recovery sometimes we have a guest speaker, sometimes we have a lesson, sometimes we have special music. Uh, but before we go into that, um, the 12 steps and their comparisons. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the, um, I was going to do the eight principles, but how about I just do it myself? How's that? Um, step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7.18 Step 2. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2.13 and step three, we made, a, we made a decision to turn our life and care over to the will of God. I got that wrong, but you get the idea. Two, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, Romans 12.1. It's funny when you start reading out of memory rather than actually reading what's on the page. Number five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, James 5.16. And step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up, James 4.10. And step seven, we humbly ask him to remove all of our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. 
And step eight, we made a, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you, Luke 6.31. And step nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother, then come offer your gift, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Step 10, we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly, promptly admitted it. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. And step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for his knowledge and his will for us and the power to carry it out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3.16. In our 12th step, having had a, spirit, a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and practice, practice these principles in all of our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6 1. In God's grace, lasting change is possible. First of all, this is um, my car got broken into about a year and a half ago, and all my testimonies were in my car. So I was taking a class called The Journey, which is what class I was in when my car got broken into. Um, and in The Journey class, you have to write a narrative, which is kind of like a testimony. So this is going to be my journey narrative instead of my CR testimony, which somebody hopefully read and got something out of out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so I um, need to get my glasses on. Uh, hi, my name is Tammy, and I'm a grateful believer and follower of Jesus. Um, I'm, hi. I struggle with codependency and post-abortion shame and guilt, and this is God's story of saving and redeeming a wretch like me. Amen. Amen. Yay. Um, I love that Out of the Grave song. Woo. That makes you want to get up and dance. That was so good. Um, because of his amazing grace, I am now I'm found and learning to surrender more and more to him every day. You'd think at 63 you'd learn to surrender everything, but folks, it doesn't happen. You keep learning how to surrender things. Um, so this is a little bit more of a timeline than a regular testimony, but so, yep, I was born on March 9th, 1958 in Porterville, California. Uh, my dad's name is Kenneth, and my, he was from Texas, and my mom's name is Marguerite, and she was from Oklahoma. So I am an Okie, um, <laughs> although I was born in California. Um, I'm an only child, and my mom was an only child, and my dad had a, had a sister, but she died when she was really young of pneumonia, so he was raised as an only child also. Um, my mom was 28, my dad was 29 when I was born, and back then that was kind of old older, you know, people had kids younger back then, but um, uh, my mom was always a working woman, um, and I was in child care, daycare, they called it back then, Mrs. Hoy's daycare, um, from the time I can remember, I was in child care, so my mom worked all the time, and so did my dad. Um, my growing up years seemed normal, as most of ours do, because that's what we're doing, we're growing up. Um, we lived in the same town as my, Porterville, as my grandparents, my dad's uh, mom and dad. And, well, it was his stepdad, because his real dad died. Um, but we were only a few blocks away from my grandparents, so we saw my grandparents all the time. And, and uh, um, it was nice to grow up in the town by your grandparents. And now my son lives across the street from me. So, <laughs> um, um I think, so I can, all I can remember from the time I can remember is going to church. Uh, we went to the Church of Christ, much different than this church, but uh, we went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all the kids stuff, everything. I just remember going with my dad. I think my mom went early on, but I, I don't have any memory of her being at church with us. Oops, 
Did you do this turn your phones off thing? Because I forgot about that. Um, so we did have a lot of church friends that we did stuff with, my mom and dad. Um, they were kind of like our family, you know, our church family. Um, I lived right by my school, that I grew, so I walked to school. It was like two doors away, um, which was nice. And I played sports. I was kind of a tomboy. Um, and we took a two-week vacation every summer. We drove to Oklahoma and spent a week there, and then we went to Texas and spent a week there. Um, we played dominoes and cards and caught fireflies and hung out with relatives, and yeah, it was nice. Life seemed pretty normal. That's what I grew up with until fifth grade. Um, and then my parents separated, which was really strange back then. People didn't get divorced and separated like they do now. Um, and I was like, what's going on, you know? Um, so my dad moved in with his parents, which was only a few blocks away. Um, and he was really sad, and he didn't want a divorce. Um, I do remember my mom had a boyfriend for a time. Um, he was younger than her. Um, and at the end of the whole thing, it didn't last very long, but she kind of gave me the choice of what do you want? what do you want me to do, kind of? I, I'm in fifth grade, you know, what do you think I want to do? I want my dad to come back. So they got back together, but they had a deal that he would get a better job. So um, she worked at the state hospital in Porterville, and he worked at a tire company. He was a accountant. So seeking a better job, he enrolled in computer school back in Oakland, in Oakland, California. This is when computers were just starting. I mean, just starting, like... I remember seeing his, his pages and pages of green and white lined paper when he would write something, you know, and all out in hand. And he was really good at that. But um, so he got in right at the right time. It didn't seem like his school was very long. Um, but he, he finished and he got a great job with Kaiser in Oakland. Um, so, uh, but I'd lived in Porterville all my life. And that was the only place I knew and all our friends were there. Um, so he, we decided to try to sell our house in Porterville and move up to the Bay Area. Well, the house didn't sell, so we leased it, um, and we ended up moving into an apartment, um, in Lafayette, California. Now, Porterville, down in the valley, Lafayette, over in the Bay Area. Night and day, different. Even, I mean, it's bad right now. It's really different over there now, but... Back then, it was really different, too. Really liberal, really, I mean, <laughs> which isn't, <laughs> back then, <laughs> it wasn't even liberal, but um, it was to, the, to me then. Um, it was very different, and I didn't know anybody, and I think my mom kind of went into a depression. She kind of just sat there and watched TV all day, and, you know, I'm going into sixth grade, and I didn't know anybody, and I didn't, so we were living in an apartment, and um, we had a pool, so... I went down to the pool every day, um, and there was a, the, the apartment manager's son was at the pool every day, too, and he was older than me, and um, I ended up being there a lot by myself, and uh, I ended up getting molested by him, and um, it wasn't bad, it wasn't terrible, but it did open my eyes to things that shouldn't have been open to. So um, then school started, yay, so I couldn't go to the pool anymore. So that kind of put an end to that. That was a blessing. Um, God's protection, I believe. Um, school was fine, much more liberal than what I was used to. Um, and it's weird because now boys look different to me too. They were always just my buddies before I didn't, you know, but... but that had all changed. Um, so the people leasing our house uh, ended up backing out of it, and we moved back to Porterville, which was nice, too, because I, I kind of got to go back to my old town, but I wasn't the same person anymore. Um, my dad would uh, stay in Porterville for the weekend. He would get up early Monday and drive, and he had a little apartment in Oakland, and he'd stay there all week and work, and then come home on the weekends. So I was home a lot by myself, uh, and unfortunately, I became, since I was, uh, my eyes were open to boys and 
everything that goes on with boys. Um, I became sexually active in middle school. Um, only by the grace of God did I not end up pregnant in eighth grade. Um, and then our house finally sold. We were ready to move. So we moved to Pleasant Hill, California, which is another kind of liberal Bay Area place. But it was really nice. And I decided, oh, I was going to get to start over because nobody knew me there. So nobody knew what I'd done. Nobody knew what had happened to me. So I was getting a fresh start. Um, I was leaving my dirty secrets behind. So I just poured myself into school. I played sports. I played all the sports and tried to stay away from boys. Um, then in my sophomore year, I met my first ex-husband. <laughs> we'll call him that. Um, <laughs> my, who would become my first husband and then my first ex-husband. Anyway, so we became sexually active uh, after a while. Um, I stayed away from boys pretty much till then. but um, And unfortunately, I became pregnant at 16. Uh, my mom found out. She was like, livid no way this is not happening I can't really remember it's kind of like total blackout but it was like you're getting an abortion you have no choice boom done over it's done um, I didn't have a choice I had no say in the matter uh, at that point my parents had separated so my dad wasn't even in the house and my mom was just nope um, so I dated Mike off and on through high school um, we both worked in the restaurant business and when we, after we had graduated from high school, we were still dating, I should have known, because we broke up like three times a year, really dumb, so. But um, uh, we've heard about, because we, we both worked in pizza parlors over in the Bay Area, and we found out there was a pizza parlor for sale in Stockton, which I had never even been to Stockton before in my whole life. I didn't even know where it was. So uh, we decided to drive over and take a look at it. And we asked people in Stockton where the best pizza was, and they told us, and we went and had it. And we said, ew, ours is way better than this. And we were young, and I was 20, he was 21. We didn't had no plans, so we borrowed money from our parents and bought the pizza parlor and moved over here and opened up the pizza parlor, um, which is really crazy to do but we did um, and it worked out great but right before we were to move here I found out I was pregnant again this time I did have a choice but out of fear and selfishness and really bad timing um, I chose to abort another child um, terrible decision the guilt was terrible this time it was way worse because I had a choice um, However, moving and owning a business, uh, it was really easy to be a workaholic and keep myself from thinking about anything. Uh, we were busy all the time, um, and busyness and workaholism is my go-to <laughs> escape. Um, so it still is. Um, business was great. We bought a house, we bought a car, we bought a boat, all the you know the things the, that you're supposed to get that are supposed to make you happy. Um, and I got pregnant again, not long after, um, we moved here. Um, and this time we were ready, as ready as you can ever be. And I was, <laughs> you know, I don't know if we're ever really ready, but, um, and I'm so thankful God that allowed me to do that because I know many women who've had abortions that really have a hard time getting pregnant. And it's very sad to me. Um, so I had Trevor at age 22 and Alex at age 24. Um, and after Trevor was born, that's when the guilt and shame of the abortions really kind of, <sighs> really hit me. Uh, and, and I'll have to say that that affects like every relationship in your life, with your parents, with your husband, with your in-laws, you know, with your, the kids that you have, it just affects everything. Um, so I was going to try to make up for it by being the perfect mom and the perfect parent and um, obviously that didn't work um, and what I really needed to do which I didn't really learn till I got to celebrate recovery was I needed to confess and repent of my sins and to surrender my life to God but I wasn't ready yet I was still trying to make it work my way um, 
I even thought I could earn grace and forgiveness, but I just needed to ask for it. Um, I thought I could control everything and make everything right. That's an illusion, and that's Satan telling you you can do that because you can't do that. Um, and so, once again, what I really needed to do was surrender. So I did the best I could. As I, I, I put my boys in Christian school, preschool, and Christian school early on. Um, and my in-laws had moved to Stockton also, and his parents had visited this church. And for the life of me, all the time I knew them before, they'd never even been to church. But they came to this church right here, and this, there was chairs in here. This is what, there was no building over there. Um, and so we started coming, too, because they invited us, and it was great. I walked in. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is what's missing in my life all this time from I remembered when I, you know, when I had that foundation when I was a young girl, um, and I was like, oh, boy, this is, this felt like home. So I've been here ever since. That was, uh, I believe, in 1984. So uh, it's been a long time here, and I love quail, and I, and I love all the stuff we have to offer here. Um, and so once we started coming to church, Mike got busy doing other things on Sunday, like golfing and boating and stuff like that. So uh, I was here a lot by myself. Um, through many bad choices but on both of our parts, uh, our marriage didn't survive, and we divorced in 1990. At that point, we had two sons, three businesses, and lots of stuff. Um, I kept my little yogurt shop. Mike kept his two pizza parlors, and I was still determined to be the super mom and make up for all my mistakes. Um, instead of stopping to examine my life and my choices, I jumped right into another relationship. Uh, when we don't stop and learn, we tend to keep making the same mistakes. I've done that a few times. Um, I thought Steve was a good guy. He liked my kids and sports, and sports were really big with my kids. Um, he even came to church a little bit. Uh, we got married, and then he started drinking again and stopped coming to church, and I thought, wow, I was really stupid. I fell for it. Um, <laughs> so um, that marriage didn't last long, about a year and a half. Um, so at that point, I tried to step back. I was like, okay, this is, I don't want to repeat this again. Let's stop this cycle. Um, I just poured my life into my kids and my work, workaholism, my go-to. Um, eventually, I started dating a man I had known for quite a, quite a while because our kids played Little League together. Uh, we got engaged. I let him move in with us, which was a no-no. I knew that was a big mistake. Um, I was trying to be a godly role model for my kids, and I was failing terribly. Um, I was very convicted at living this way, uh, but I was still at church every Sunday, um, sliding in and listening and sliding out and, you know, trying to wear my mask and be the super Christian mom. Never mind, I'm living in sin here back, you know, at home and stuff. So, you know, that just kind of heaps the shame and guilt, keeps he heaping it on you. Um, I remember after hearing a very convicting sermon one Sunday, uh, it was funny because I had heard it, Charles Stanley was talking about it, and Pastor Mark was talking about it. And I was finally like God telling me, you need to obey. So I went home and I told my boyfriend that he had to leave uh so uh it was you know it was sad but i knew i was doing the right thing at that point i knew i had heard from god like you're trying to convince your kids to be this way but you're not being this way so um i asked him to move out and he did um and then at that point um so trevor's my oldest He's a very compliant child. He was very, uh, you know, he didn't take risks. He wasn't very adventurous. He was just kind of steady and, you know. And then Alex was all over the place. He was climbing everything and doing everything and um, much different. Pushed all the boundaries, snuck around. He was girl crazy. Um, he started hanging out with some bad guys in high school. But he was very smart and a really good athlete, too. So, you know, he made it through high school, praise God. But 
the storms were coming. So Trevor attended Delta, and he was playing basketball, and Alex was went decided he got accepted at Cal Poly, and he couldn't wait to get out of here and go to Cal Poly. Well, my illusion of control was crumbling, and uh, I was becoming desperate for God. So Alex left um, in August of 2000 and was home in March of 2001. Strung out on drugs, dropped out of college with his girlfriend back, moving back home. So what was a good codependent mom going to do? Well, she let him move in her house, um, thinking I could fix it again. So um, I was crazy trying to figure it out. I, I just couldn't, you know, he did outpatient programs. He did NA. He did AA. He came to church off and on. He took some classes at Delta, but he was an addict, and and I really didn't understand what that meant. I was invited to an Al-Anon meeting, and I realized I was not alone. That was so like, aha, there are other kids in this same position, and these poor parents feel the same way I do, like we're the only ones. Um, and it was really nice, and I met Carl and Sharon there, and that's how I found out about CR here was Carl and Sharon because Carl started this over here. Um, it was nice to be able to open up to people and be honest about your troubles and fears, just like we do in here every Tuesday night. You, we don't have to pretend we could be honest and open. Um, so I was finally coming to the end of myself, my illusion of control, surrendering everything, and I started attending Celebrate Recovery here at Quail in April 2003. Um, at that point, Alex came too because I was like, hey, come on, let's go, let's try this thing here because he's already been to all these other things. Maybe these great guys here will get him clean and sober. You know, that's what I was thinking as a codependent mom would do. Um, anyway, uh, that's where I re finally realized I can't control or change anyone, but God was telling me I needed to stay here and work on myself. So I've been here ever since. Um, and God was very patient. He was waiting till I was ready to just lay everything down and turn it over to him. And it took me a long time. And if you're in that position, I suggest you don't take so long. <laughs> Speed it up if you can. Figure it out, surrender it, and lay it down. Um, my granddaughter was born in 2004, Cassie. And she lived in my home with me um, with Alex and her mom for the first three years of her life. Alex was a serial relapser every, you know, so often, uh, he would get up to, you know, six months or and then he, he'd relapse and stuff. Um, I was busy working and Trevor was at Sac State, um, and Alex was trying to get it together still. Um, so Trevor and Alex, these are kind of like the highlights, you know, uh, highlight reel of Tammy's life. So Trevor and Alex both Graduated from college, yay. Trevor graduated from Sac State. Alex graduated from Fresno. Um, and Cassie was born in 2004. Trevor and Kim got married in 2007. Wow, 2007. Uh, <laughs> that's a long time ago. Um, my grandson, James, uh, was born in 2011. And his sister, Joey, was born in March of... 19, 2019. Um, so those are really highlights. Um, so my mom and I have had, you know, I come from a divorce family, so that's weird. You know, it's like, but as being an only child, what are you going to do? So I always invited my mom and my dad and my stepmom to everything. So, um, I, that's just how it was. If you want to come, you come. And so um, they did, and they did fine. And my mom and I, our relationship is fine now. My dad passed away about nine years ago. So, um, and then his wife, my stepmom, um, was diagnosed with early uh, Alzheimer's uh, about three years ago. So it's been really strained with with them uh with her it's hard to have a conversation on the phone with her now so it's really hard and with covid you know it's hard to go see people because people don't see people um so uh but my mom um i'm an only child so she's 91 she was just with me for a month because she her foot was hurt and uh we 
you know, things went pretty well. But she's stubborn, like me, and uh, I'm not going to force her to come and live with me until she's ready. So she wanted to go back home, so she's back home. And I've learned to let people have their own way and, you know, I, you can't force anybody to do anything. So all this time at CR here, I, I've gone through a lot of different stuff, you know, stuff with my kids, stuff with my grandkids, stuff with my parents, stuff with my marriages, stuff with my breakups, all that stuff. Um, and the thing is, at the end of the day, God is faithful. Um, if we just keep coming back to him instead of running to other things, he is faithful. He will deliver us. He will heal us. He is our rock. He is our foundation. Um, I really have some favorite sayings it's here at CR. Um, the first one is, we're as sick as our secrets, because I think that's so hard when for me, uh, my early abortions and then uh, promiscuity and stuff like that, you just kind of hold that in, and it, and it just follows you and makes you sick until you get it out. And, you know, um, this is the place to get it out. This is the safe place because that's how God works. And um, so I encourage you <laughs> tonight. Um, sometimes you think that, you, oh, my gosh, I've confessed everything. And then I've said that before when I write my testimony or do something. And it's like something will pop up. And it's like, oh, I really need to confess that. So, um Anyway, I'm confessing tonight I'm a grumbler and complainer now, and that's not good because I don't like doing that, and it doesn't help anything. So I'm trying to overcome that now, too. Um, I've hurt people, and I've been hurt by people, and I've hurt myself. But God is awesome at recycling our pain um, to his gain if we let him. I think forgiveness is the biggest part of this whole process. Truly, I do. Um, I've been through many step studies I've been through pure desire I've been through a lot of stuff and I think the whole forgiveness aspect of our forgiving ourselves accepting God's forgiveness and forgiving other people is the only way we can get through this this life here um, and also taking time to grieve our losses which I never did until I got into recovery I didn't know we, there was a lot of losses I had people had died and relationships had died and you know things that happened and I never grieved them I just thought you have to just push on through and roll on but that doesn't work either because it's still there um and God never wastes a hurt so all this stuff that has happened to me I know has happened to other people too and that's why we come together to share our common hurts habits and hang-ups um so God has turned my mess of a life into a message of his grace and mercy to others. Uh, he's allowed me to serve here at CR for 18 years now um, and uh, to do pure desire. Um, and I've also been able to speak about the shame and guilt of abortion at a couple of uh, pro-life things that we've done through the church. Um, and I'm hoping to re start an abortion recovery class pretty soon. We'll see how that goes once we start, because you kind of got to do it in person. You can't do the Zoom thing. I'm not, I'm a Zoomer. Um, so God has been very good and patient with me and continues to teach me every day. Um, I still work full time, and I, I think that, I, I think God has something else. I just don't know what it is yet, so I'm trying to listen, trying to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Um, because there's a lot of great stuff to do out there, uh, stuff for other people, stuff to build the kingdom of God, and that's what's really important. Whether you, And I could do that through my work, or I could do that through other things. And God has given me um, a lot of avenues to do that, and I'm very grateful. And keep coming back, because it works if you're worth it. So thank you. That's Tammy. That, I'm Tammy. That's my story. Okay. The last minute. I haven't heard that version. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, once again, we're about ready to close the large group portion of our program. Once again, if there's any newcomers in the crowd tonight, um, please just sort of migrate to that side of the room and somebody will be over there to meet you. Um, in the meantime, uh, would you please join me in the serenity prayer? God, 
Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is and not as I would have it, trusting that you make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. All right, see you back here at 8 o'clock.